نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم. The topic that was given to me was on the topic of racial equality. One is we choose a topic and we talk on that topic. And one is we pinpoint the problem at the core and we try to solve the problem from bottom up. Sometimes what happens is we choose something, we choose a topic, it's a good topic to talk about, then we listen to it and we enjoy the topic and we go home and that's the end of it. But what I'm talking about is unless we identify each topic from the core and we try to solve it from the core, we will never have a change in the community. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's speciality was he was Jawami al Kalim. Jawami al Kalim means he really spoke. That is why there is not a second man, there is not a second person, be he a prophet or a common man in history, whose every word is documented. Like how the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are documented. There is no book more superior than the Quran. It is the words of Allah. After the words of Allah, there is no words more superior than the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nations, countries, they can be built, they can be built on few fundamental hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even if we don't go into the depth of the thousands and thousands of hadiths that are there, even if we focus on the poor few small ones, if we focus on Buniya al-Islam wa ala khawsin, we can, we can build a nation on that. Shahada to Allah ilaha illallah. A nation where everyone believes that there is no God but Allah. Muhammadan Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu Muhammad is the Rasul of Allah. When someone believes that there is no God but Allah, then he will follow the Quran. When someone really believes that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of that Allah, then he is going to follow all the things of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the Qim of Salah, he establishes Salah. That means no matter what happens in social, in society, in the open, there is nothing that is against the wish of Allah. There is no disobedience of Allah done in the open. Wa'ida is zakah, there is no one who is poor. Wa tasum Ramadan. It's not that one group is rich because they're giving, and one group is rich because they're taking from the rich. No. It also shows shares. The rich, they don't feel like I'm superior because I'm giving, but rather in the Ramadan, they share the hunger with the poor man. And they sit and have, they pray in the same sof in the masjid and they share the food in the same basakhan, the same place of eating. Ya Allah, and Hajj, and Hajj, where there is no difference between a rich and a poor man. The richest man in the world, he can be the king of Saudi. If he is going to do Hajj, he has to come wearing the same two sheets of clothes. If he is the poorest man and living in the jungles of Africa, when he does Hajj, he also has to wear the same two sheets of clothes. Just like when a man is leaving the world, everything he has acquired, he has attained all that position, all that rank, all that money, he has to leave it behind. And he has to walk into that grave with that two sheet of clothes. So any nation, whose foundation is on this one hadith, they're okay. Every one of them will go to Jannah. Before we move further on, there is one principle that we have to understand. We have to understand the principle of what is temporary and what is permanent. That's the one principle before we move anywhere. When we say temporary, we mean anything that will cease to exist is temporary. Our life is the most temporary, but everything our eyes falls upon is also equally temporary. Our life is 60 years. If we look in the narration, some narrations will say the life in the grave, which is after we leave this world, the, the, the change, the, the, the journey from, from this dunya to the al barzakh the change from this life to the afterworld, there are narrations which say that life is 40,000 years. How many years? 40,000 years. And then from there, it's going to be the day of Qiyamah, 
which if we look at the Quran, if we look at the tafsir of the Quran, in one ayah it says that وَإِنَّ يَوْمًا عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ كَأَلْفَ كَأَلْفَ سَنَةِ مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ that one day in the Akhirah is going to be equal to 1,000 years of this dunya. One day in the Akhirah is going to be equal to 1,000 years of this dunya. And then we have another ayah which says, كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةِ 50,000 years. Now we don't know if the calculation is based on the years of the dunya or if the calculation is based on the years of the Akhirah. So, we don't, I'm not going to Jannah or Jahannam yet. I'm just going to, from here to the Qabr, from the Qabr to the Day of Judgment. From here to the Qabr, from the Qabr to the Day of Judgment, the, it's very hard to say how many thousands of years is going to be just in this part. Now if we look at insan, if we look at uh, the world, of course Allah Ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam. And that's when we track our time. But when Allah created his dunya, we don't know. They have their scientific researches, but Allah knows best. There is no guarantee. So from the time the dunya was created until the day Allah will ask Israfil salam to blow into the trumpet and he will blow and everything will become dispersed. And, and then eventually, the first time it will be blown, everything will be destroyed. The second time it will be blown, everyone will be revived and the whole earth will become a flat ground, will be the ground of mahshad. The ground where Allah will take, we call it the judgment day. Uh, before I continue, let's talk about the Judgment Day. Judgment Day itself, Allah has designed it such that because of the intensity of the heat, there is no, forget, forget trees, not even grass will grow. Forget trees, not even grass will grow, even the earth itself will cease to become, will to see, remain moist and soily, it will become sandy. Even the earth is still going sandy. The narration, the proof of that is the narration where it comes that on that day there is going to be pin drop silence. Only the sound of people dragging their feet on the sand, walking towards the place where Allah will have the actual gathering. So wherever people, people are buried, whichever part of the world, which is why we always make dua, Allah makes makes our qabr in, in Medina. So that when we come back alive from the qabr, then we wake up with the Jamaat of Rasulullah sallallahu and his companions, whoever is there. But irrespective of exactly some riwayat say it's going to be in Sham, Syria, irrespective of where it is, everyone will have to walk to that location because there is going to be no bus, there is going to be no airplanes at that time. So when they come walk out of the Qaba, they're going to be dragging their feet in that sand and walking towards the place of Mahshad. The place where the, where the Hashar will take place, the place where Allah will take all the reckoning. And then the only sound will be the people dragging their feet in the sand. Because if you look at Al Qari'ah, Al Qari'ah, Mal Qari'ah, Wa Ma Adarak Mal Qari'ah. Do you know what is Qari'ah? Yawm Yakunu Nas Kal Barash Al Mabthuth, Wa Takun Al Jibal Kal Aini Al Manfush. Even the mountains, the rocky mountains. I don't know if you, most of us have been to Makkah and Medina. When we travel the square, that highway, that few hundred kilometers from Makkah to Medina, or Medina to Makkah. Most of the mountains to our right and left is completely rock. It's not dead. It's rock. And you can ask the scientists, I can tell you, that how much pressure, how much vibration you need to crack and crush the rock into dust. One is, I say, one is something soft substance. For example, substance like such as a dirt itself or soil or sand. You blow it and it starts flying. And one is we have rock. Jibal, rock. Even that rock is going to crumble and become dust due to the vibration of the sound caused by the trumpet of Israfil Now a human ear is something soft. If a rock can crush, imagine what will happen to the human ear. That is going to be the halat. That is going to be the condition before the day of judgment. Such a long journey yet and the reality. The reality. Every single man knows someone who has passed away. Even kids here, they have seen someone, some dada, some nana, someone, someone has passed away. That means we know, we know with guarantee that we are also going to pass away. That means we know that life here is extremely temporary. We do not know what happens after life, which is why Allah sent the Quran and Allah sent Rasulullah to give us a guideline to show us a pathway, the pathway to Jannah. 
A pathway to Jannah, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi has described, Allah Ta'ala has sent the Quran and has described and identified and cleared the way very clearly. There is nothing ambiguous anymore. Only people who don't believe in the Akhirah, who don't believe in Allah, only they can say that there is nothing after death. Life is short, live it up. But people who believe in Allah, whether they be Christians or Jews, even Christians and Jews believe in the Akhirah. If we go to our neighbor just right next door, we can ask them, do, do they believe? If they didn't believe in the Akhirah, they wouldn't be coming here whenever they come here. They believe in Allah, they believe in the Akhirah, that is why they keep on coming on Sundays and whatever to their masajid. Why do they do that? Because they believe in the Akhirah. It's just that unfortunately their belief is wrong and we were responsible for making their belief right. Which we have up to yet failed to do. May Allah give us a to correct ourselves in such a way that we become an example for them so they automatically come to the deen. But that is an effort we must do also. But before we go to the effort of, of, the, of the people, for example, if we are living in a society, there are a few responsibilities which Allah gives every single individual. There are some responsibilities Allah gives to a society in general together. One is what we call farz ayn one is what we call farz kifaya. I want everyone to remember these two terms. One is farz ayn one is farz kifaya. Farz ayn is that farad if a person does not do, anyone, any person, once he becomes mature or she becomes mature, if she misses or he misses that farad, then he is going to be disobeying the commandments of Allah and Allah will write a sin for him. Allah will put a dot into his heart. Which we know the story that when a person makes too much disobedience of Allah and he does not do istighfar and tawbah and change his ways, then a time comes when his heart becomes so dark that nothing good seems good to him anymore. As we say, he becomes his whole heart becomes cancerous. But the lucky thing, with the good thing about Deen is that Allah has kept the door of tawbah open even if someone's heart becomes pitch black. That is why even we have seen that forget insan, even shaitan will be given a chance. Even shaitan will be given a chance. We know the story, right? Even shaitan will be given a chance by Allah that if he bows to Adam alayhi salam again, Allah will forgive him. But his pride will stop him from doing that even the second time. Ya Allah. So the faraz, so faraz ayn is that which every individual is responsible for. Faraz kifaya is that which if a society does it, then the sin drops off from the whole society. For example, Someone has passed away in the Muslim community. For example, Danbury. Someone has passed away in Danbury. We have two masajid here. So one of the masjids, we take responsibility of shrouding the brother, finding a good cover, and then putting him inside and do a janazah. And then every single person in Danbury will not be a sinner. But if a Muslim passes away, and then they bring the body to the masjid, we throw the body out. And they take it to the next masjid, they throw the body out. Then the Christians, they cremate the body because no one wants to take the body. Then the sin of not performing janazah on this person will fall on the entire Danbury. Every single person will be going to sinner. So we understood now. That's Farzah Kifaya. If one person does it, everyone loses it. No one is sinner. Farzah Ayn is, if I don't do it, I'm a sinner. When it comes to deen, the way Allah Ta'ala has structured the deen out, if we look at the steps how Allah has structured it out, Allah says in the Quran, A'udhu Billah Min Shaitan Rajeem, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا Allah says, O you who believe. In the Quran, whenever Allah says, O you who believe, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Then Allah is specially speaking to me and you. This is not for Allah Ta'ala says many places in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الناس يَا أَيُّهَا الناس, right? Ya Ayyuhal Nas means all oh, people. That means Allah is speaking to everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims. But whenever Allah says in the Quran, Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Aman, a great, a great Mufassirin used to say that anywhere in the Quran you see Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Aman, I want you to raise your ears, prick your ears. Why? Allah will either command you to do something good that will benefit you, or Allah will or order you to stay away from something bad which will harm you. Something that will be harmful to you, Allah will tell you, don't do that. Something that will benefit you, Allah will say, do that. So whenever Allah says, Ya Ayyuhal Amanu, we should keep, pay extra attention. Obviously, whenever the Quran is recited, we should pay attention. Allah says, Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu, Hu Anfusakum Wa Ahdikum Naam. O you who believe, protect yourself and then your family from the fire of Jahannam. 
our teachers used to explain to us and say, listen, Alhamdulillah, many of us, many, especially those who are working in the community, many of us, we have this emotion inside our heart that, oh, we want to do the work of deen, we want to uh, do that work, we want to do that work, we want to do that, that work. And every single work we're talking about has some, is very good and is very beneficial. And if I can successfully do that, I will be immensely, immensely rewarded. Sometimes that reward will continue for generations. But even if a person works and turns, for example, he makes an entire Danbury Muslim, but he does not take care of his own self and his family. He does not take care of his own iman, his own actions, his own zikr. He doesn't take care of his own sifat qualities like sabr, like shukr. And he does not work on his family. He does not work on his family. Then his, because he disregarded himself and he disregarded his family, Allah could still throw him into jannah. So the first step is that if a person has to, for the sake of himself and his family, if he has to take a step back from all the other work he is doing, even if it be a work of deen, then he has to do so. Because his first ayin, it is his responsibility and Allah will take him to task on this responsibility on the day of the Amr. A person can victory the whole world, but he didn't take care of his family and his family lost iman, then they will not allow him to go to Jannah. There are scenarios. There are scenarios where Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam, he tried his best, but his son did not accept Islam. And to prove that he tried, even at the last moment, when the flood started coming in, water was pouring down from the sky. Water was boiling from the, below the earth. It was coming up. Even at that moment, Nuh alayhi salam called his son and he said, come, come, come. The son, what did he say? He said, I won't join you. I will find shade, refuge in some other top of the mountain. That means till then he did not believe. That's a fact that Nuh alayhi salam never stopped trying. Even till the last moment. He didn't stop trying for on his family. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam on the other hand was different. Ibrahim alayhi salam's father was not just an idol worshipper. He was one of those men who manufactured idols. He was a manufacturer of idols. Yet Allah Ta'ala turned his son into Ibrahim alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam was one of those prophets, or I would say one of the only prophets who actually gave da'wah for 950 years. And his son turned out to be different. So there are scenarios where we try and it doesn't work out as different. But the general command of Allah is, you have to try. We have to try. And if we look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never ever considered anyone too young to be given the da'wah of Islam. For example, we all know Ali radiallahu anhu was only 10 years old or younger. He was only 10 years old or younger when Rasulullah sallam gave him da'wah to Islam. Rasulullah told him, listen, if you don't like my da'wah, then you don't have to accept, but keep it a secret. He was his cousin. And if you like, then you accept. He went in one day, he thought, 10 year old boy, in one day he went home, he thought about it, and he came back and accepted Islam. 10 year old boy. We know the famous story of the Jewish person, the Jewish person living in Medina, one of the neighbors of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who was a person of good character. He was a Jewish person, but he was a good person. So one day, Rasulullah got the news that his son was very sick and he was about to die. Rasulullah went to the boy, he turned to the boy, and he told him that pronounce these words that I am the Rasulullah and there is no God but Allah. Just pronounce these words. When he said it the first time, the boy looked at the father, the father did not, the father did not respond. So the boy also did not respond. Second time, Rasulullah said, listen, son, say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Say it. He again looked towards the father, the father did not respond, he also did not respond. The third time, when Rasulullah said it again, Allah put it into the heart of the father, the father said, follow what this man is telling you to say. Just do it. So when he, once he did it, once he did it, he passed away. And the Jews were trying to take him to their graveyard. So some stopped them and said, we have more right over him because he is now a Muslim. Even this boy was not yet a balad. He was not mature yet. 
he hadn't reached puberty. So Rasulullah Sallallahu did not regard anyone too young for the words of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Coming back to our children, coming back to our children, the way Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us is when a child, before a child is born, it comes all the way from before marriage. Before marriage, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us that we have to look for a spouse that is pious. Obviously, we can say we don't have much control over the fact which Allah has already paid his time. But Allah does appreciate when someone makes the intention and makes effort for it. Allah appreciate. Allah is the is that Zat who is Shakur. Allah is the one who is most grateful. Allah is the one who is most grateful. Imagine Allah's generosity that he gives food, drink, water, power, everything to people who don't even believe in Allah. Person who is, he's in, people, even shaitan, who is the open enemy. He's been fighting against Allah since the time he was sent to this world. Yet Allah never stopped feeding him. Allah never stopped making, letting, Allah never gave him sickness. Allah never made, made him go crazy. You understand? Allah is of that caliber. So when we say Allah is grateful, we mean we don't have any idea how grateful Allah is. So when a person makes a sincere intention from his heart that I want to do a certain thing, and he backs it up with sincere effort, then there, the chances are Allah will make him successful. Chances are Allah will make him successful. And if physically he does not attain success in this world, outwardly, physically it seems he has not attained success in this world, but because of his intention and effort, Allah will make him successful for eternity. Allah will make him successful, successful for eternity. So it comes regarding the, the, the families that before we start marrying, we should have the intention that Allah, I want to find a pious girl. What we do, what we do is, I would say it's a very big mistake. Sometimes when, when we are looking for our own children, we are looking for their spouses. Or if I'm a young man and I'm looking for my own spouse, both scenarios happen in this country. What happens is I'm, I'm thinking, oh, the Imam Sahib said I should look for a pious wife. But you know, I want a pious wife, but I don't want a pious. I'm serious, it happens. People say, yes, you know, you know, pious, of course, you know, I want my kids to be pious, I want my kids to respect me, I want them to pray five times salah, I know. But I don't want her to be too pious, you know. If she is in complete hijab, how am I supposed to show her to my friends? You understand? If she is wearing complete hijab, how am I supposed to show her to my friends? I might lose status in my friends, so I'm looking for a girl who is pious, but not too pious. Why? Because of the fact I said I don't want someone who's too pious, it will pull me down in my entire life. It will pull me down in my entire life. I destroyed my intention. Even that much of, of in my intention, I should not have this much of, of, of deficiency. In my intention, I should not have this much of deficiency. If it is like that, that I'm looking for the most pious person in the world, yet Allah has given someone else to me, then I'm like, okay, Allah, you have decreed this for me, so alhamdulillah, I'm happy with what you have given me. But I myself wanted the most pious in the world. If someone has that kind of intention, inshallah, he will be successful in this world, and if physically he seems to be at loss, Allah will make him, give him such success in the akhirah, in the year after, which he cannot imagine. Once a person gets married, the hadith of the marriage is, is a long hadith. When you marry, look into your look in your spouse for four qualities. Look at their how beautiful, how pretty they are. Look at how much wealth they have. Look at their family lineage. And then before you look at anything else, look at their deen. Rasulullah said, look at their deen, look at their deen. If you have everything else, you don't have deen, then chances are you will lose. If you have deen and you don't have anything else, chances are you're going to win. Or let's say you are going to win, or get the chance. And winning is not the winning of this dunya. Losing is not the losing of this world. 
that's what I'm trying to get into our heads. Winning is not winning position in this world and losing is not losing position in this world. Wallahi, if winning was winning in this world, then Fir'aun would have been one of the biggest winners. Wallahi, if winning was winning in this world, then Namrud would have been one of the biggest winners. Qarun would have been one of the biggest winners. Haman, Abu Jahl would have been one of the biggest winners. But we have seen their fate. They are being punished for over 5,000 years. Fir'aun. He is being punished twice daily, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, for more than 5,000 years. That means he didn't even live in this world for 5,000 years. He lived for maybe a few hundred years. But he has already been punished for 5,000 years and it will continue to, as long as his dunya arrives. And on the, well, on the day of Qiyamah, Allah will put him in a worse and worse and more severe punishment. So winning is not the winning in this world. Losing is not the losing of this world. Remember this principle. Keep this principle deep into your heart, deep into our hearts. This is going to be very important for our success in this world. Success is not a success of this life. Happiness is not the happiness in this world. Losing is not losing in this world. If I am losing in obeying the commandment of Allah, then I am successful. If I am winning, disobeying Allah, then I am unsuccessful. I want to say it again. If I am losing, but I am following the commandment of Allah, then I am successful. If I am winning, but I am disobeying Allah, I am unsuccessful. Once we find the spouse we are looking for, then there is a dua. The dua I want everyone to look it up later on, inshallah. Inshallah, our other ulama after me will repeat this dua. Allahumma jannibna shaytan wa jannibi shaytana ma razaqtana. Allahumma jannibna shaytan wa jannibi shaytana ma razaqtana. It means Allah protect, protect shaytan from messing up our progeny. That's the khulasa, making it short. It means Allah protect our kid from being messed up by shaytan. Simple language everyone will understand. Protect our progeny from being messed up by our, our by shaitan. And it comes in the hadith that when someone says that before before meeting the wife, Allah will make it such that if they have a baby from that meeting, that child that is born, when he leaves the world, he will leave the world with iman. That's what matters, right? If a person doesn't matter what he does in this world, when he leaves the world, if he leaves with iman, then he's successful, right? Imagine how easy it is to guarantee our children don't lose their iman. This is how easy it is. Masnoon dua. We don't know the power of Masnoon dua. We don't know the power of the dua. If we say the dua and leave the house, how much power the dua holds. We don't know the dua, the power of dua that when we leave the masjid, which dua we should read, which, which feet we should leave with. When we enter the bathroom, we don't know the power of the dua that we should say before we enter the bathroom. When we leave the bathroom, we don't know the power of the dua that is there in leaving the bathroom. Before we begin eating, we don't know the power of the dua Allah has, has told us, has taught us before eating. These duas are not the simple duas that we learn and we sometimes forget, sometimes we remember. These duas are, each one of them is powerful enough to move mountains. Each of these dua is powerful enough to move mountains. The Muslim dua of this, Allahumma jannibna shaytan wa jannibi shaytan wa razaqtan. So after we get married, we have to keep on reading these duas every time we meet the spouse, both of us, husband and wife. Then once the child is born, once the child is born, as soon as we realize, the mother realizes that she's having the baby, then she has to change her life into, if she wants pious children to come to this world, then she has to come on more piety. The father has to ensure that he does not bring any haram into the house. The father has to ensure he does not bring anything haram into the house. There is two harams, okay? One is the haram that, for example, pork is haram. Gelatin is haram. An animal which was not slaughtered with the hand, a Muslim, and saying Bismillah, and cutting the four veins or three veins, that's haram. The food itself has some material in the food which is haram. That is the haram we understand very easily. The other haram is if we are earning money in a haram way. 
We are earning money. If me, if I'm earning money in a haram way, then even if I buy halal food with that money, that food also will be haram. So a husband has to ensure that he does not bring anything haram into the family. That means the furniture in the house cannot be from haram money. The rent of the house cannot be from haram money. The payment of the house cannot be based on interest. The payment of the car cannot be based on interest. There cannot be anything haram in the house. The furniture, the chairs, the, 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 food, the food, the clothing we give to the wife, the family, everything has to be from halal money. If we cannot earn a huge amount of halal money, that means we cannot live a high standard in life. Leave, leave, leading a high standard in life is not for us. Allah will never ask any individual on the day of Qiyamah that, brother, why didn't you buy the $5,000 IKEA set? Allah will never ask that on the day of Qiyamah. But Allah will ask that, brother, whatever you brought into your family, was it halal or not? So if we have to lower our standards of living because we want to stay on halal, even for that, Allah will reward us. Wallahi. Even for that, Allah will reward us. Okay. Husband makes sure there's nothing haram coming into the house. Wife makes sure that especially during the time she has the baby and after the baby is come to the world, she does not commit any sin. The wife makes sure that as soon as the baby is there, until the baby comes to the world, as long as the baby is growing up, all the way up to the age of 9, 10, I would say till the age of 21. I would say till the age of 21, we have to make sure that there is nothing in the house that is against the commandment of Allah. We have, we have made a joke out of raising children. I shall say the joke. For example, if you look, let's look at our families. Sometimes as a mother, I am so busy. Or my, husband, my child is giving me a hard time. What do I do? I take out this. I take this out, put on, turn it on YouTube, find a good cartoon and put it from the baby. Here, put it The kid is looking at the cartoon. Hmm, oh. And I'm feeding the baby. So the baby is looking at the cartoon. He doesn't understand I'm, I'm feeding him banana or vegetable. Because I know vegetable and banana is good for the baby. But if I don't put this in front of the baby's eyes, he's not going to eat the vegetable and the food. So what do I do? I put this in front of the baby's eyes and he's looking and jumping at the cartoon. He's going up and down like this and he's eating his food. What did I do? This food was supposed to be a blessing for the baby. This food was supposed to make him physically fit as well as spiritually strong. But I have destroyed the entire spirituality by showing him one cartoon while watching that, while eating that food. And then once the child is done with eating with food, the child is active, mashallah. His brain is working, he's growing, he's learning that world. So he needs someone to keep him busy. Now I don't have time to keep him busy because I have to watch a show too. So I give him another cartoon. I give it to him and say, Beta, you watch this and let me watch mine. And then we make dua, Allah, make my son like Musa So that he can defeat Firaun. I'm making the dua and he's watching cartoon. What kind of Musa Islam will Mr. Cartoon be? You understand? What is haram is haram. What is haram is haram. We all know what is haram. Most Muslims, we, most of us as Muslims, we know what is haram. We just don't, since we don't realize the effect this haram has on my life and the life of my family, that is why we allow them to do that. That is why we are the way, wallahi, every single cartoon these kids see, they pick up things from that subconsciously is growing inside them. They're seeing something, they're seeing a mockery, they're seeing a younger disrespecting an elder. They see someone punching the other person, they see someone killing all these people. Those things are imprisoned, are, Im are, what do you call this? They are, they are, these things are, as an imprint, it goes into the mind of the child. As an imprint, it gets printed into the mind of the child. So we have children who if they hear that someone has passed away, you see him crying and rolling over and over. Like, oh, oh, it's, well, such a big calamity happened. Then you have children who hear that the whole country, one million people died and is laughing. Because every day he kills a few people on GTA, GT or I don't know those names. He kills a few people on video games. So when he hears that someone, two million people died there, he's like, that's fine, I'll just kill a few, you know. See, these kids are laughing. Why they're laughing? Because for them, 
not saying they watch videos, Alhamdulillah, they're good kids, mashallah. They don't do all that stuff. But you know why they're laughing? Because they know what goes on in the, in, in the community. From the time a child is born to the time the child reaches 21, there is four places where our children will spend most of their time. There are four places where our children will spend most of their time. Number one, they will spend the most amount of time in the house. Number two, they will be spending time in their education. That education can be the school, it can be the madrasa. It can be the school, it can be the madrasa. Then they will be spending time with their, with their friends. And they'll be spending time in general in the outside world. I want to say it again. It's important. That's why I'm, I don't want to go into too much content. I want to make a small content, but something we can actually do. Something doable. Our children, they spend time in these four environments. And these four environments shape their mind. Just simply the topic of racism, right? Simply the topic of racism. If we go into some societies, we will see that they are so racist that if anyone who is maybe 20% uh, shade darker than their skin color, they will start, they will throw rocks at that scarf. You have you have places like that in this world, maybe in the country we live in today too. Then you have those places in the cities where maybe in one block you will have people from 30, 40, 50 different ethnicities and they're all cool with each other. No problem. No one thinks he's superior to the other person. What happened? They both eat, both of those, I can guarantee you, they both eat eggs and they both drink milk. I can guarantee people in the city drink milk and have eggs and those people there also have milk and eggs. And why is it that those people can't stand when they see someone 20% 20, 20 shade darker and these people, they're okay with someone who is completely different to them? Why? It is the environment. It is the environment at the home. It is the environment of the school. It is the environment of the friends and it is the environment of the outside world or wherever the world, their outside world is. These four things shape a man's understanding. It shapes a man's character. It shapes a man's thought. It shapes a man's aqidah. It shapes, shapes a man's akhlaq, his character. What happens with many times, what happens is we have parents who keep a very, they keep, you see, one is being very strict. I am so strict, I don't allow this, I don't allow that, I don't allow that. The child says that the only thing I'm allowed to do is sit down in my chair and look at the book. I'm not allowed to do anything else. So every day he's looking at the book, he's thinking that when and how can I leave this house? He's thinking. And good thing is we can't see what he's thinking. Otherwise we would have got a fit. And then the day he leaves the house and he becomes the biggest gangster of the time. Because he could, he got nothing in the house what he wanted. Now outside the world, he wants everything. He wants the most respect, so he sees that going into drugs and gang is the biggest way, easiest way of getting respect. So he goes to that path. When it comes to a spouse, he looks for someone who is the most pretty, as and obviously in this world, the ones who are really pretty cover themselves, so you don't know they're pretty. The ones who are the most ugly keep themselves completely open, and they seem to be pretty. So he falls after the one who is the most ugly, but the most unclothed. That means the most vulgar in society. And then after getting kicked by three or four of them, and finally he realizes that I should rather listen to my parents. But by then he also had two, three kids of his own from the two, three people. And he couldn't do his therapy out of them as well. So he himself went off the track and he made sure three of his sons also went off the track. Or his daughter, whatever they are. Mistakes happen in one place and the repercussions, the effect of that grows far and wide in society. That's what I'm saying. Environment at home has to be something that there is no disobedience of Allah. Our elders say the parents should be more of a friend to the child. More of a friend to the child, friend with strictness. That we are friends. These are the things which are good things to do. These are the things which we are going to do. These are the things which are bad for us, either physically or spiritually. Spiritually means if it's against the commandment of Allah, it's bad for us spiritually. If it's unhealthy, it's bad for us physically. So what do we say? We don't say that, okay, if chocolate is unhealthy, they can never eat chocolate. No. Since chocolate is healthy, we'll give them chocolate sometimes, but we'll give them small amounts. And then we'll say, since I gave you chocolate, now you have to drink milk. Since I gave you chocolate, now you have to drink a banana. I have to eat a banana. Since I gave you chocolate, now you have to eat, eat, eat eggs. Then we make sure that physically, 
they got what they wanted. Their craving was fulfilled, but at the same time, we made sure we bargained with them to eat other good things. So the parents need to create a more of a friendship, friendship in the French friendly environment at home, where the child actually the son feels connected with the father, the daughter feels connected with the mother. A children has few basic needs. For example, if you look at the in, in economy, in economy, if you look at the how do they call it a triangle? You'll see the man has a few basic needs. First is he needs to be eat and he needs to be fed. Then gradually he needs recognition. He needs security. Once he has security, then he wants position in society, recognition. That's a man's need, an adult's man. A child also has needs. A child needs to feel loved. A child needs to feel he is important. He needs to feel like he belongs where he belongs. So there are needs of a child as well. If you look at psychology, we'll have all this information. So what happens is, if we, Rasulullah what did he do? Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He would ask. He would take mashwara. Remember, he is the prophet, the most intelligent person, or you can say the most intelligent being in this world. As, as, a, as, a, as a creation, the most intelligent creation in this world, person is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No one would say a man of that caliber needed to take mashwara, to ask for advice, ask for counsel. But the Sahaba, the Sahaba says this, that we never ever saw a man asking for more counsel than we saw Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam asking for counsel. Regarding his family matters, regarding his personal matters, he always had someone close. And regarding social matters in general, he used to gather those people in general and ask them. So in matters at home, even matters at home, for example, uh, what should we, uh, what, for example, the children have been performing well. We told them to memorize a few surahs, they memorize a few surahs. Or even academics, academics they got all A's. That means they made effort. Then we want to take them for a treat. We want to take them somewhere or we want to give them a nice treat. So we tell them. So we can, one is that I decide, okay, I'm going to give them, bring them pizza. Maybe they had pizza three times last week and they don't want pizza anymore. I haven't had pizza in last one month, so I'm like, pizza is going to be really good. What happens? When I bring pizza, the kids are like, ah, oh, again. Then we look at their face, we're like, no appreciation, no sugar. That's what we're thinking. And the kids are like, ah, oh, this is our present. What happened? If we simply had asked them, the kids, dear kids, what do you guys want? I want to give you guys a treat, what do you guys like? You guys did so good. They would say, okay, we want ice cream. Then we go find halal ice cream, give them ice cream, and they're happy and I'm happy too, mashallah. What happens is if we do this little bit, we have made them happy, we have become happy, and the environment at home is so nice. So one is to give them importance where needed, sometimes seek their counsels in matters which are pertaining to their level. Make sure that there is no disobedience of Allah in the boundary of the house. First step. Second step is their education. They're going to, for schooling, they'll probably go somewhere else. For their Islamic development, they'll probably go somewhere else. What happens is sometimes if we look only at academic education, if we look only at academic education, sometimes what happens is we get very high education, but within that education, the culture is such that they lose their iman. Many scenarios have happened, many kids, intelligent, intelligent students, they lost their iman because their parents at that moment thought that education was the most important. So find, they found the place, the Christian schools, this school and that school, which had the best education, they sent them there. When the kids came back, they had no iman. We have scenarios like that. So one thing is sending them to a good school. One is, and the second is to make sure that the school they go to will not affect their Iman and their character. Two things. One is their Iman must not be affected. Number two is their character should not be affected. Oh, I, I went, I jumped, I missed one part. The first, when our kids, they learn to speak, as soon as they're born, we should give the Adhan, right? We should give the Adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Because we want the first words they hear when they enter the world to be the names of Allah. And then when they learn to speak, before they learn to say Amma and Abba, before they learn to say Mommy and Daddy, we must teach them the name of Allah and La ilaha illallah. Okay? Before they learn the name Amma and Abba or Mommy and Daddy, we must, we must teach them the word of Allah. 
So when they learn to speak, they learn to speak one or two words, they're laughing and joking, they're running around saying one or two words, that's when they have to say Allah, Allah. And how do we do that? Whenever they speak, we, use, we say Allah. I'm holding the baby, rocking the baby, I say Allah. I'm playing with the baby, I say Allah. He will say Allah. When he says, I say Allah, and I'm smiling and playing with him, he will say, oh, Allah is fun, so he'll also say Allah. And then once they learn to speak sentences, we teach them, la ilaha illallah. So Allah and la ilaha illallah is the first Arabic word that we should teach them. And then gradually what will happen is when we taught them Allah and la ilaha illallah, we planted the seed of Iman into their hearts. Iman is not logic. Sometimes we go into big debates and we, give, we put a very fiery logic and we defeat the, whoever there is and we are like, MashaAllah, now today everyone is a Muslim. By maybe two persons became Muslim. There was half a million people in the debate, two people became Muslim. And we become so happy that we won the debate. Iman is not about debate or, or defeating someone in, 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 a, in, a, in a conversation. Iman is inside the heart. So we plant the seed of La ilaha illallah and Allah. And then when this boy starts doing good deeds and he stays away from sin, one day a time will come when he will become more and more firm on Iman. Once they pass the stage of that and they start growing up, then we have to teach them regarding Aqeedah. Amantu billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wal yawmil akhiri wal qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allah ta'ala wal ba'thi ba'd al maut. This is Aqeedah. Aqeedah on Allah, on his books, on his messengers, on the angels. And the most difficult part hereafter day of judgment the difficult part in this is the plea there was a story there was once a person he had a young young child he had a young child but he was he suddenly became very ill and he was passing away when he was passing away his son rushed to him and he said dad 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 please give me some advice before you pass away please give me some advice before you pass away of course blood is the strongest connection in the world Blood is the strongest attachment in the world. So he was asking for advice. Rasulullah so sorry, that father, he said, son, make me, sit me up. So they pushed him, put him on the pillow, put him on the wall. He turned to the son and he said, listen, whatever has happened to you was destined to happen to you. Whatever did not happen to you was destined not to happen to you. Basically, what happened to you, you could have done whatever in the world you could do, yet you would still have had that. What you don't have, you could try everything in the world to get that, you would not get that. Good or bad? So the son was like, Father, I understand good, but how do I understand the bad? If something bad happens to me, how do I accept that? How do I accept Allah has this time something bad for me? How do I accept that? Then the father said that, if you cannot accept the fact that the deed, good and bad is from Allah, and you die in this condition, you will go to Jannah. One lesson was sufficient for the boy. So from a young age, from a young age, we have to teach them the, the, the foundation. For example, Surah Insan. Once a boy was in the, in, in the olden times, people, when they would enter Madrasa, they would be taught to read the Quran, and since they were Arabs, they would also understand the Quran. So, in in, in the uh, second last surah of surah uh, of the 29th para, we have surah Insan, or some of us call it surah Dahar. Al ata al insani, tainum min al lam yakun shayin madhkura. So, once a, a child was about four or five years old, and it was time for him to start education. In our system of Islam, in the past, the glorious Islam. The system of education was as soon as you were five, they would send you to the madrasa to learn, start learning Quran. They would learn, they would begin their education with Quran. Their education would not begin with ABC or with any other language, any other letters. It would always begin with Quran. So the child went and then he memorized, and within a few days he memorized the whole surah insan with the meaning. So one day the son was standing at his home, he was looking at the wall, he was kind of uh, looking at the wall in a very strange way. So the mother, when she saw her five-year-old child looking at the wall in a very strange way, she became kind of worried, you know, we have so many problems, we have this and that and jinnas and all that thing. So she looked at the boy and said, Dawood, Dawood, go and play with the other children, go and play with them. 
So the child, as if he didn't hear the mother, he kept on looking at the wall. So the mother, she became more frightened. She went and she grabbed the child and held on to the child. Oh, something is wrong. The child turned to the mother and said, Mother, are you okay? Is everything okay? So the mother was like, I thought something was wrong with him. He's asking me if I'm okay. So the mother, so ma so mother said, Baba, what were you thinking? So Dawud is saying, I have read in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says that, um, Basically, from the ayat before, where they say that the, the believers should be reclining on very beautiful, beautiful chairs, thrones, and they will be enjoying themselves in Jannah forever and ever. So the boy was like, uh, these people, they are getting such a high position, they're reclining on, they're reclining on thrones, enjoying life at the top, at the peak. Because Allah is saying, Allah accepted their endeavors. Why? Because Allah accepted their endeavors. So the son said, Mom, do you know which endeavor they did? Allah accepted that because of which Allah has given them this status in Jannah. So uh, the mother was uh, kind of uh, struck because she didn't know the answer. Told the boy, listen, listen, tell you what. You go and you play with the kids, and then when you come back home, I'll tell you the answer. Then the kid went and the mother went and asked the father. So the father sat with the child that night and the mother as a family, what we call the ta'aleem. What we call the ta'aleem at home. Where we gather, gather the family daily at home and we try to discuss some, some hadith. We try to discuss some tafsir. We try to discuss some stories of the pious, some stories of the prophets. Give us, give the whole family a boost, the energy. That this is why we are, this is the objective of our life. This is what we are doing in life. We never lose focus in the goal of our life. So when they were sitting, the father told the boy, listen, you, you, the question you had was, what was their endeavor which Allah accepted because of which they were in such a position that day? Their endeavor was, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What was their endeavor? La ilaha, their endeavor meant their effort. What was their effort? Their effort was, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So the child's mother says that whenever my child, even while playing games, whenever he remembered the advice of his father, he would start saying, La ilaha illallah. Because at that stage, he doesn't know La ilaha illallah requires an effort. All he knows is you have to say La ilaha illallah. Obviously, the time will come and he will understand the effort. Five-year-old, he has no namaz or anything. Praise Alhamdulillah. From seven onwards, we are supposed to make them practicing as a prayer. So that by the time they become 10, we have to emphasize on them prayer. So that when they become 12 and 13, or even 11, sometimes our youngsters are becoming mature much earlier nowadays. When they become mature, they never ever give up salah. They never ever give up salah. Salah is our lifeline. Imagine if a person misses one salah, and he passed away between the two salah. Remember I was saying that every person is guaranteed to die? As much as guarantee we have on the fact that we must die, we have as less guarantee on when we will die. As much as guarantee we have on the fact that we will die, we have as less guarantee of when we will die. So suppose a person, he could have prayed Zohar if he had tried, but he was like, oh, I'm so busy, you know what, I'll just pray with Asr Namas, I'll make Bada. And then he died before he could pray his soul. Or a person says, okay, I will have a little fun. I know it's, it's disobeying Allah. I know it's disobeying Allah, but let me have a little fun. After I have my fun, then I'm going to go and pray salah and make wudu and my sins will be gone. What if he dies at that moment? Life is all about a test. Life is all about a test and once again, success in this life is not real success. Failure in this life is not real failure. If success in this life was success in the man who was the ex-president of USA, he would say, I'm the most successful man in the world. But today, no one even knows what he's doing. Now they're looking at the current president. And then tomorrow they'll be looking at the next president. So in this world, we could be on the top of the mountain, we could be flying in the rocks, we could be flying in the air. But tomorrow there will be someone who will be flying higher and will be forgotten. Success in this world is not success. Failure in this world is not failure. Success is in obeying the commandments of Allah. Failure is in disobeying the commandments of Allah. 
So we teach them aqidah. We teach them the beliefs. And especially as a faith. You see, when if we instill into, for example, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْقُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ and قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Let's look at these two surahs translation. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Say he is Allah the one. The only one. Allah is the only being who is completely independent. Allah is the only being who is absolutely independent of anything or anyone. Period. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ He was not given birth to and he does not give birth to. No one could give birth to Allah. Allah was always there. وَلَمْ يُولَدْ Allah Ta'ala Sorry. لَمْ يَلِدْ He does not give birth. No one can say Allah has this Allah's son, that is Allah's daughter, this is Allah's wife, that is Allah's this, that is Allah's wife. No. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوَ أَحَدْ Since Allah is Allah and He is the only creator, He is the only supreme creator, everything else is His creation. So obviously no creation can ever be like the creator. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوَ أَحَدْ There is nothing similar to Allah. This is one part of the Aqidah. Let's look at قُلْيَا يَلْكَافِرُونَ Sometimes what happens is, of course we respect everyone. Now if we overdo this respect and we say, oh, we will go to Jannah and maybe a non-Muslim will also go to Jannah. Because he's such a good person. That's how they, now that's how they judge in the world. They say, oh, you are a Muslim but you're not a good man. You have, you, have, you sometimes you cheat, sometimes you lie. Also, also, although Muslim can never cheat and never lie. Although a Muslim can never cheat and never lie, it is the deficiency of the Iman of a Muslim that makes him cheat and lie. Or do any other sin. It is always the deficiency in our faith that makes anyone commit a sin. If he was perfect in his Iman, he would not be able to have committed any sin. So sometimes people say, oh, I am not a Muslim, but look how good I am. I give charity. I do this for the community. I am so nice. No one walks through my house empty-handed, and so on, so on, so on. And look at this Muslim neighbor. He throws trash on my on my on my driveway. He blocks my driveway. He does this. I think I'm a better person than him. No one is better than anyone. Why? Even though, for example, if I have iman, my iman is better than the other person's faith. My iman. My Islam, La ilaha illallah, is better than anything in the world. There is no, there is no, there is no question on that fact. But the question you're asking is me as a person and my neighbor as a person. Yeah, a time could come when Allah could give my neighbor Islam and he will enter Jannah. A time could come I could lose my Islam and enter into Jannah. So until or until we we look at the final destination, we will never know who is better than who. But we're not talking about who's better than who, we're talking about the faith, the kalima, the iman. With absolute conviction, without any doubt, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is the best today. It will be the best tomorrow, all the way till the day of Qiyamah. It will be the best in religion and in faith, in kalima. So, we taught them aqidah. We taught them, oh, so, Surah Kafirun. I said one part of Aqidah was Surah Ikhlas, right? Regarding Allah, belief regarding Allah. The second part of the faith is regarding Qulya uh, Ayyul Kafirun. Qulya Ayyul Kafirun, all the non believers. La a'budu ma ta'abadun. I do not worship that which you worship. Why? Because they worship who, what they think is their God. Someone will say, This is my God. Someone will say, Jesus, Isa alayhi salam. He's a God, na'udhu billah, he's a prophet. Someone will say, uh, we have three, not one, we have three. And then they make that their God. Someone will say that these are the few idols. And then we have the big one, we have the few small ones. Someone, many, many things, many, many people will say many, many things. But the principle is, la a'budu ma ta'abudun. I do not worship that which you worship. Wala and you guys, what you worship is different than what I worship. Because definition differs. When we say Allah, we mean Allah the Supreme Being, besides whom there is no one else. Maybe there are other religions who follow Allah as that. 
But in general, those who don't believe, either they don't believe Allah exists, or they have a different definition of Allah. Which is why Allah Taala in this surah made it very extremely clear. What you worship, I don't worship. I worship Allah. Wala, wala ana abidu ma abatum, wala antum abidu ana ma abud. Rakum dinu kumariyadin. To you belongs your religion, to me belongs my religion. So when it comes to faith, here Allah did not say a person. Allah says it's faith. When it comes to faith, a person, a boy should never fall into doubt that because that man outwardly seems to be more nicer than me, that he's better than me. My faith is the best. So one is the faith itself, one is the strong conviction that my faith is the best faith, there is no faith better than my faith. Okay. Let's cross Aqeedah, let's go to the other uh, environments. Environment at school, environment in madrasa or the place where we choose for their Islamic upbringing, environment of their friends, and environment of the outside world. In school, we have to choose that school, we have to choose that school which will not damage their iman. Many schools, colleges, educations, what, what do they do? Because of the fact that logic is used a lot, and logic is used without solid foundation of iman. You see, if we had logic with the foundation of Iman, that logic would not harm someone too much. But when we don't have Iman, when we don't have Iman and then we have logic, then people start asking questions for which they have no answers. And the time comes when they get so confused that they say, forget the fact, forget religion. Why do I have to follow religion? Then they lose religion at all. And if you lose religion, you have lost Akhirah. If someone has lost religion, he has lost his hereafter. He's done for good. How long will he live in this world? How long will he enjoy this world? And then what will happen afterwards? So we have to make sure we choose a school which academic is important, but make sure it doesn't damage and harm the Iman. When we choose their friends, their friends will most probably have the most influence on them. We have a uh, Mulana in, the, in, the, in South Africa. His name is Mulana Ridwan Kaji. Ridwan, R-I-D-H-W-A-N. Our young friends should the younger ones, the ones who are reaching puberty, we should let them uh, listen to his bands, very good bands, on the issues and corruptions of the what the youth go through at that age. Yeah? So Molana Ridwan Kaji, he was giving a youth bayan. So in the youth bayan, he was mentioning the fact that children, why do they need good friends? Why do they need good friends? He was saying that, for example, a time comes, for example, young children, they, they, they need love. Uh, am I taking someone else's time? Huh? I'm okay? Sorry. Uh, so he was saying that, why do young children need, uh, uh, young children, they need love, right? They need love. They need respect. If we can spoil our children with love at home, then they will not look for love outside. If we can give them the respect they deserve, not, for example, we have people who are two who, who cross the limit. Suppose husband wife has a fight, then they call the 10 year old child to become judge and jury. We have that also. That's also excess. You give someone more than he deserves, then he becomes bad, he becomes corrupted. That's why in the real world, if something is worth $20, they will not, you, no one will pay $45 for it. If you pay 45 for a 20 dollar product, then the economy will go into inflation. So in the character, you work the same way. So what happens is, if he gets the respect he gets at home, then he will not look for respect elsewhere. So for example, he was saying many youngsters, when they don't find love at home, because of the fact maybe the parents did not get that training, then they look for love in the haram ways. They go and ask different people for their numbers. Can I have your number please? Can I have your number please? And then they start with texting, then chatting, then live streaming, and then it goes further and further. Boyfriend, girlfriend, and all that. He says at that age, he was saying his own story that when I was young, there was something I heard from other students, it was very cool. Something that uh, people do after marriage. He was saying that people told me if you do it before marriage, then you're preparing for marriage. So he said that I started, I wasn't wanted to know who can I ask regarding this thing. He wasn't understanding. So someone told him that uh, he thought if I asked a normal kid, he would, get, he would probably shout me down or he'd yell at 
Abby. So he said, I chose the kid who was the most naughty, the most uh, mischievous in class. He said, I went to the kid and I asked him that, how, what is this? So he said that, oh, you, you don't know? Oh, it's so amazing. He said, you have to, uh, you have to buy this and buy this and buy that. Then you have to buy this cream and that. You have to do a little rubbing here and there. And then you will get, prepare yourself for marriage. He says, I believed him and I started acquiring those things. But I got caught in one week and I couldn't go further. Allah saved me from that fitna. He says, if I had a good friend at that moment, he would tell me, are you crazy? You want to do that? You want to destroy your life? If you do it now, when you need it after marriage, you won't have anything in your body. Your factory will be done. Production is complete. We can't give you any more. Then you'll be suffering the rest of your life. People will make a fun and mockery out of you. So he says the fact that friendship is so important, this is the, this is the proof. If we had a good friend at that time, he would have not told them to go there. Like this in any particle of life. So we have to make sure that we let them have friends, but their friends have to be from the best families with the good character and good iman. When we send them to madrasa, we have to make sure they we find a good, good, honest, uh, pious teacher who will love the child as well as treat the child with the true understanding of Islam and not be careless and looking at his own pockets. When we give them love in the house and we become their friends, when they go to the outside world, they want to go for vacation, they want to go buy something. Even if we tell them, go with your friend, they will say, no, dad, I want to go with you. You take me. So when he says that, I have protected him in the outside world, I have protected him in his friend circle, I have protected him in his school, I have protected him in his madrasa. Like this, if I take care of the child until he reaches 21 to 25, inshallah, that child will never do anything wrong in his life. Or if he does, he'll come back. So let's start from the base. Let's start from the foundation. Let's start with them from when they're a child. Let's focus on their Iman and Islam. From when they're a child, in the home, in the school, we keep an eye, make sure they, don't, they are not picking up anything wrong. Make sure we make sure we make a system where they can come and learn deen daily. If we cannot bring them someplace to learn deen, then we have to take off from job if we have to, and we have to sit with them and teach them deen. Either we bring them to the masjid where they learn with other children, or we take off from job and we come and we teach them ourselves. We have two choices. We don't do that, we will see the repercussion 20 years from now. Unfortunately, when we realize, we think those younger than us, they don't realize. Because they're like, oh, what are you talking about? Then the whole cycle starts again, the whole chain starts again. Allah give us self to understand and make amal and build our families from the young so that they become strong enough to take on the world outside. And inshallah, by taking on means, so they can bring this Islam and this Iman and make means of all these neighbors. We have all these people in the whole country, in the whole wide world, how they can all come into Jannah and we live in Jannah together happily for eternity. Allah give us self to understand and make amal. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulill